Hello. Hello there. I uh, hope you can all hear me. I am Dr. Car uh, Caitlin Fisher uh, from the University of Sydney. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Dr. Carl's house party. We are so excited that you could all join us for what will be an extraordinary journey through science with the one and only Dr. Carl. National Science Week always puts me in a party mood, albeit responsibly in these 2020 COVID times. I've got my science snacks, I've got my safety goggles, and I'm raring and ready to go. We would love to hear from you at home and see your science themed house party photos, which you can share to Instagram or Twitter with hashtag Dr. Carl's house party and tag at Sydney underscore science. There are some Dr. Carl book prizes to be won for the best photos. Before we get into it, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land water and culture. I am currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are on and pay respects to their elders past, present and future. It is my absolute privilege to introduce you to Dr. Carl. His media career spans more than 30 years talking about science on the radio, TV, podcasts, newspapers, and books, 45 books to date, with more on the way, I'm sure. His accolades range from being named one of Australia's 100 National Living Treasures to his awarded Ig Nobel Prize from Harvard University for his groundbreaking research into belly button fluff and why it is almost always Blue. Last year, Dr. Carl was the first Australian to be awarded the UNESCO's Kalinga Prize for the popularization of science by the United Nations. Ever a lifetime student, Dr. Carl Doctor, has degrees in physics, mathematics, biomedical engineering, medicine and surgery. Carl is currently the Julius Sumner Miller Fellow at the University of Sydney where his absolute mission in life is to spread the good word about science and its benefits. Connecting now to Dr. Carl at House Party Headquarters, we will take any and all of your questions from the audience. Um, you can type them during the talk. Please submit them via the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen, and Carl will answer as many of them as he can at the end of his talk. Now let's see if I can bring Carl in. Hello, Carl, can you hear me? Oh, hang on, you're still on mute. Let's see if we can figure this out. Now, Dr. Catfish, if I, if I were to say, no, I cannot hear you asking if I can hear you, would that be a paradox and would the universe come to an end? I do hope not. Possibly. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Catfish and everybody else for setting it up. Uh, I'm wearing my COVID safe uh, safety goggles and I've got my bestie coming along here. So I've been, got, we've got a special guest appearance here with our new friend, Tay Tay. She's coming along to help. So look, thank you. She'll be doing a number later on. And thank you ever so much. Okay, now that we're in the show, I can take off my COVID safety glasses. Now, when I do the shopping, I get to shop what I want, where I want. And so I came up with a packet of this absolutely fabulous placenta soap. Now, there we go. So it says here, um, don't know why this thing doesn't work. We'll find out one day. So according to Miss Earth Air 2012, Stephanie Stefanovic, healthy youthful skin starts from nourishing it from within and you too can look younger and fairer, wait for it, with new placenta. Now notice here that it says on the packet that it is advanced placenta care formula. I am a seriously experienced shopper. If it had had at the top, mediocre placenta care or even regular, no way. I go only for the advanced stuff, but I was worried about this. It says skin whitening. Now, I don't know how much bleach it's got in it, which is why the packet is still all shut. You see, it might have zero bleach, cool with that, or it might have 150% bleach, in which case, as soon as I wash my hands with it, 
the bleach would dissolve my flesh and I'd be left with nothing but bones. So what on earth can I do with this skin whitening stuff? I have to use science to test it. And science is really good at testing stuff. Now, there's an old saying in science. For every problem, there is a solution that is easy to understand, intuitively correct, simple and 100% wrong. And so in many cases, you could be very simple and wrong. And what you really need to be uh, is complex and right. And it's kind of like science is related to how carbohydrates should be. They should be complex. And so simple is appealing, but complex, that's not the way reality is. I mean, reality is confusing enough. Imagine that if you had an anus that disappeared several times a day. Well, that would be really confusing. And that is actually the case with this animal that has the amazing disappearing anus or the transient anus, as we call it. Now, this is an area of hard science, but it's a rather sort of delicate area. So it's prone to a lot of puns like, do you need a lot of cheek to do this research? Is this area of research kind of crappy? If you don't do the research, will you fall behind? If you do the research, will you become the butt of other people's jokes? But the point is this, animals with a disappearing anus actually do exist. And you're thinking, hang on, the anus is normally wired in there from before you're born until you die 24 hours a day, seven days a week. What on earth is going on? So now is the time to do a little experiment. Now. The experiment is not to cover half your body, the left, with sunblock and the other half not, and then live like that for a couple of months and see if you have different coloured skin on each side of your body, but rather to cup your hands into like so. Make a little cup like this, but like that. Now imagine with this little cupped hand, what you've got is some water in there and some solid stuff and some gas. Now. Do something to your fingers to release the gas without releasing the liquid and the solid. And your anus does this 14 times a day on these things that we call farts. Big it up for the anal sphincter. So, but where did it come from? Hard to believe, but true. According to the evolutionary biologists, we don't know where it came from. And so they've written this paper called Getting to the Bottom. Oh my God, the puns still come. This is actually a scientific paper. Getting to the Bottom of Anal Evolution. Oh my God, aren't they ashamed of anything at all? Okay, now believe it or not, the anus is one of the pinnacles of evolution over the last 550 million years or so. But we still do not know how it came. If you look at the anus in a whole bunch of different animals, you'll find that it's all different. Did it come from the gentle system? Or did it come from the hindgut of a coelomate ancestor, whatever that is? Or did it come from the endoderm, which I'm not sure what it is, but I think it's different from ectoderm and mesoderm. The point is this, we still do not understand how the anus evolved, but we do know this. Every animal needs a gut or a gastrointestinal tract. Well, no, it doesn't. I just lied to you. Parasites don't need one. So think about a parasite. It starts off on the outside of your skin. And in the picture, you can sort of move across to the right and it burrows into the skin and burrows in deeply until finally you end up with a proboscis getting into a blood vessel. And then it goes one stage further. Don't need no outside nutrition. It goes one stage further and it disappears from the skin. It's now entirely within the body of the animal that it's invaded, but it's not entirely within. You see, it releases eggs, and these eggs go into the gastrointestinal tract, and they go to the outside world. But a little bit longer, add some time, and evolution leads you to a situation where it's not connected to the outside world in any way whatsoever. Um, it has zero connection, and so parasites do not need to be uh, having a gut because they live off the animal they're in. Okay, getting back to the gut. You start off here with the mouth and you sort of munch the food up and there's a bit more munching that goes on inside the stomach and then that relates to the intestine. So the food gets broken down and it gets broken down into a bunch of small chemicals which get absorbed in the intestine and they're used for various things, building blocks, nutrients, energy and they go out into the world 
through the anus. I didn't know this before, but it turns out that there are two kinds of anus. There's the blind gut, which is called a sac, which is very, very simple, and it works, but, and here's the problem, in and out, the problem is this. If you want to eat lunch, you've got to vomit up your breakfast first. Oh my God, bummer. Yes, this is what the coral has to do. Now you're thinking, a coral, that's not an animal, that's a rock. It is an animal inside a rocky shell, and it is a stationary animal that has glued itself to rock. And right there in the top middle, you can see it's got a red arrow going up and down. So it basically eats through its bottom or it poos through its mouth. And this works just fine unless you happen to be a ribbon worm. And ribbon worms have got this property of being incredibly long. They reckon they go up to 50 metres. We've measured one at 32 and they was able to stretch it to get up to 50 metres. Now, imagine if you're a ribbon worm and you haven't got an anus, well, you've got to vomit up 50 metres of food before you can have your next meal. So that's why we came up, evolution, with the through gut. It's more complicated, but you get a better breakdown of the food, better absorption, more nutrients. And best of all, you can have lunch while you're still processing your brekkie. Now, to do this, you need a fairly complicated gut. And if you look at this picture of the gut here, you'll see it's got numbers all the way going up to 19, which is a prime number, so that proves it's complicated. So the food comes in at the top, goes around, nutrition gets taken, and 10 metres later, in the human, it comes out at the bottom. So this transient anus, yes, this is true. There is an animal that grows an anus every single time it has a poo. Oh my God, which is every 10 minutes when it's a baby or every hour when it's an adult. And what is it? It's a jellyfish. Um, it's most, they're, they're mostly predatory, these little jellyfish that grow a new anus all the time. It's called a warty, so it looks like it's got warts on it, comb and jelly. Well, comb is a fancy way of saying it's got cilia. And it is the largest animal to have external cilia to use them to get around in the ocean. This guy eats a lot, 10 times its own body weight every day. And how big are they? Anything from about that much, which is a millimetre, up to about that much, a metre and a half. But the ones that have the transient anus, they're about that much to that much, 50 to... Uh, 100 millimetres, you know, half a fist across to a fist. And they are truly ancient, 515 million years old, and they could give us a clue as to how the anus evolved. That's this guy over here in light blue, and here he is again. And here's the paper that really got me started. Sidney L. Tam wrote this paper, and read the title. Defecation, well that means to have a poo, by the Tenophore Memiopsis ledii, well okay, we know the name of it, occurs with an ultra dean rhythm. Well, you have a uni dean or circ circadian rhythm, which is sleeping once a day, and ultra dean is stuff you do more than once a day, like breathe or go to the toilet, although there's an average on that. Um, so it happens more than once a day, and then it says through a single, bit dodgy there, there's so I've kind of got two anuses as well as having none, right? A single, and then transient, that means coming and go, anal pore. So they're calling it an anal pore. So let's look at the picture and over here you see a thing labelled AO. Obviously, is that an anal opening? No. It's the, anal, it's the apical organ. In fact, it's this whole thing here, right? But the left anus, right, see it's got a left anus and a right, right anus? I didn't tell you about that, did I? So it's got the left anus over there and you're thinking, there's just an arrow pointing at nothing. Why can't I see anything? And the answer is because it's a disappearing anus. It's not there yet, but we'll show you photos of it soon being there. <coughs> and then over here, below that, between the uh, blue arrows, is a thing called the left fork, you know, related to the left anal opening. And that's kind of like your rectum, it's sort of like a holding chamber before stuff goes out. And correspondingly, there's one on the right, a right anal opening and a right anal fork. Okay, so the warty comb jelly has not just one anus, but two of them, or well, potential anuses, but hang on, look, hang in there, guy, it's cool. You see, there's a flatworm that has 
nearly a hundred anuses on its back. See those yellow spots? Every single one is an anus. Go figure. Okay, now we're going to look at it having a poo. Here we go. See the little blue arrows over here? That's a moderately full rectum or anal fork. And then over here, it's got bigger. Oh my gosh. And then over here, it got smaller again. It had a poo when we weren't looking. Now for the, the money shot. Here is the photo of it having a poo. See where the black arrow is coming out? That's those little particles of poo. And look at the distance between the blue arrows. That rectum or left anal fork is just swollen with poo. And then about 30 seconds later, whoa, it's shrunken down. Now, here's something weird. We humans, well, we're either left or right-handed and you're sort of stuck with that. And the watercomb jelly, it is left or right anus. It's an interesting bit of information, information, but I'm rather dubious of what you can ever do with it. But at least one thing about the warty comb jelly. It might lose its anus, but at least it'll grow another one every 10 or 60 minutes, depending on how old it is. But there's a creature, a South American scorpion, that can lose its anus forever. Bummer. So here it is. Scorpion sheds tail to escape. Okay, yep, it's losing its tail. I've got, got that so far. Consequences and implications of autotomy. What is this word, autotomy? And how does this scorpion lose its anus permanently forever? How? And the trick is evolution. It's working on that old principle. Evolution doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be good enough that the next generation can have some babies. And so the anus, it's not between its hind legs. No, it's not there. No. Where is it? It's near the end of its stinger. Beyond a, and here comes a new phrase, cleavage plane. Oh my gosh. See those little black dotted lines and the red arrows pointing towards them? They are cleavage planes where autotomy can happen. They can just shear off with virtually no damage to the host animal, scorpion, lizard, etc. So autotomy is the deliberate sacrificing of something big and full of fat and juiciness. And you're thinking, why would you give that up if you're a lizard or a, a scorpion? Well, you might lose part of your body, but you'll keep your life. And this is what lizards do. And they have a clean break at the cleavage plane. And often, the bit of the body that's been left behind has its own blood supply and nerve supply and keep on pumping for a while and will twitch and saying, over here, eat me, eat me, eat me. Something like out of Monty Python. So the anus is way over here, beyond the cleavage plane. Now this is where it gets a little bit gory, so you might want to cover the eyes of the little ones. Um, if you've been watching Altered Carbon, you know what I'm talking about here. So you grab the tail with some pincers, some tweezers, and you can see the little arrow pointing to it. And then the scorpion thinks, I'm under attack, I'm going to lose the tail. And it loses the tail. There it is on the right. Scorpion without tail on one side and tail next to it. And here it is between a person's thumb. And they're holding it knowing they can't get stung by the, the stinger because there's no stinger. The cleavage plane does its job beautifully. It heals beautifully at one hour, one day, a couple of days, a week, a couple of weeks. Beautiful clean healing. What could possibly go wrong? You guess it. See what those red arrows are pointing to? Poo. Plus, plus, plus. Huge amounts of poo building up in the tail of the scorpion. How many of them in the wild get it? About 5 to 8% lose their tails. Males more than females because, you see, females live longer, so they don't want to give up stuff because they've got a longer life to invest in, but also, especially, they need the stinger to get food for their babies. But if you're looking at your average male, they can survive for up to eight months without an anus. They can actually mate and they can father at a time 35 babies. So evolution is good enough. It gets by. And you're thinking, well, at least we humans are safe. Well, when I was a medical student, my boss... Um, in gastroenterology told me about a case he came across when he was training in London. And they had a patient who had not passed anything 
from the back end for six months. That is a huge amount of time not to have a poo. And he had a big tummy. I'll sort of gloss over how they fixed him up, but I'll just talk about the words laxative and enema and maybe even a long-handled teaspoon. You know what I'm talking about. So when you're a medical student, your hours are not your own. You might be lost, rostered on for 40 hours a week, but you're doing 100 hours. And to get through, you need coffee. And coffee keeps you awake because it's got this fantastic chemical in it, a chemical called caffeine. Now, you can see over here, it's got the name of 137-trimethylxanthine. And blow me down, try. So there's one methyl, there's another methyl, and there's another methyl. And this big blobby thing in the middle is called a xanthine. And it is a vasoconstrictor. It clamps down. It closes your blood vessels. There is another food, along there with coffee, which I count as a food, which is absolutely essential for the maintenance of good spirits in these times. And I'm talking about that prince of foods, chocolate. And it turns out that the chemical in chocolate, one of the chemicals that tastes so good, is given the, was given the name by Linnaeus himself, the god of botany. He gave it the name of drink of the gods. Theo, as in theology, and bromine, as in drink. Theobromine, drink of the gods. And you're thinking, wow, it looks just like caffeine. And it's missing a methyl group. It's only got two of them. So it's 37, not 137, and it's di, not tri, methyl. And wait for it. It's a vasodilator. It actually opens up your blood vessels. What a wonderful thing it is. So, you've got these two chemicals. Caffeine, which brings you up, keeps you awake so you can work long shifts, and it closes your blood vessels, so it increases your blood pressure. The other one, in chocolate, close, opens up the blood vessels, so that drops the blood pressure down. And this has solved the problem that the philosophers have worried about for thousands of years. We now have the proof. Yes, it's there. Here it is. Number one, God exists. Number two, and if she exists, she wants you to have chocolate whenever you have coffee. Now, let me just ask you a question of you. I can see you out there through my magic eyes, through the 5G cameras that are going through the covered glasses that are in the vaccine with the microchips that were put there by Bill Gates and the lizard-changing reptiles. I can see, here's a question. How many of you have ever said, or you heard somebody say, gee, I want to get healthy, comma, I'm going to give up coffee. I've said it. I was wrong. No way. Coffee is actually good for you. Caffeine. But the coffee is good. There's a whole lot of other chemicals in there besides the caffeine. Some of them in decaffeinated coffee. It improves your life expectancy. It makes things better if you've got liver disease, if you have type 2 diabetes, prostate cancer, heart disease, and oral and skin cancers. Coffee improves the outcome in all of these cases but for me coffee is this stuff here oh my god look at that color that crema oh my god it's just so beautiful but we're in a weird situation where apparently we've been making coffee the wrong way how do i know well talk to the baristas now they go in their international barista competitions and part of their task is to make four identical Espressos. Wait for it. They cannot. They're all different. Why can't they do it? We'll get to that. It turns out we have been making coffee the wrong way for six centuries, and here's the answer as to what's going on. Chaos is causing clumping. The way you can remember that, C for chaos, C for clumping. And the cure, I'll give you a hint, less, not more. So let's look at this beautiful coffee. Oh, my God. Trying to add soy milk and chai latte and a twist of lemon and a bit of cinnamon is rubbish. You've just got to drink that stuff the way that nature intended you to be drunk, with that crema just there. It's just so beautiful. And the people who tell you how to make it so beautiful. The National Espresso Institute of Italy. And they give you a formula. Six and a half to seven and a half grams of coffee hot water or just a bit under 90 degrees centigrade. You've got to force it through under a bit of pressure, maybe three or four times the pressure inside your car tyres for just a bit under a minute, and you'll end up with roughly, ballpark figure, maybe 25 mils of pure heaven, 
But wait for it. The baristas cannot do this consistently. Now, this is very important. If you are inconsistent with your coffee making, you can really offend people. And one person you do not want to offend is Dirty Harry. Every day for the last 10 years, Loretta there has been giving me a large black coffee. Today she gives me a large black coffee, only it's got sugar. Can I sound? A lot of sugar. I just came back to complain. So, he obviously loved coffee the way it should be, which is complex, with thousands and thousands and thousands of chemicals in it. And to extract those chemicals, how old should the coffee beans, when you start grinding them, how fine should you grind them? How much do you shove in the basket? How hard do you squash it down? What sort of temperature and pressure and time? There's so many problems. So luckily, I found the answer. It was in this journal here called Matter. And this is very important. Matter is really important for a whole bunch of reasons. I matter, and you, dear audience, you matter. Until, of course, you multiply yourself by the speed of light squared, in which case, then you energy, according to Einstein's E equals mc squared. Moving right along, this paper talks about systematically improving espresso insights from mathematical modelling and experiment. And this I found absolutely astonishing. When you grind coffee, and I don't mean one of those uh, herb choppers, no, you know, grinding wheels, when you do the proper grinding, you get two things. You get what are called fines, very skinny little things, and boulders. Boulders? What? And there, the, so the fines are anything from about 10... And then, uh, micrometers to 100, and then the boulders are anything from 100 to 1,000. Now, this is amazing. So you're dealing with stuff that ranges in size by a factor of 100, 10 to 100 to 1,000. Wow. That's a complex mix you're dealing with straight away. Imagine if humans ranged in size from 1 metre to 100 metres high. Very complicated. Now, think about the grains. The coffee interacts with the outside world through the surface. And the surface increases with the surface area, with the radius to the square. So it turns out that over here, you've got the surface area, most of the surface area is in the stuff between 10 and 100 microns. And what you would hope, you've got here in your coffee basket, you've got your fines, and you've got your boulders. And what you would hope would be there'd be some sort of fair and equitable democracy where the hot water would come down and extract the same amount of coffee goodness from each and every grain and then leave it behind and keep on coming down and go out giving you heaven. It doesn't happen. You get clumping. Where bits of the coffee mix, especially the fine bits, they sort of go bloop into a solid, semi-solid little lump, which water can't get into. So you might have a lump here and a lump there, and the water has to go from the channels in between. So imagine that you've got a big lump over here, and you've got another big clump over there, and in between there's a channel. All the coffee goodness in your cup comes from there. No coffee goodness came from these guys because they're on a big fat lump. Why does this happen? Well, it's related to a thing we call chaos theory. And a good way to explain that is the so-called butterfly effect. Now, the way it's explained is imagine that in the Amazon, on the southern side of the equator, you've got a little butterfly and it goes flabbity, flabbity, flabbity. And two weeks later, on the other side of the equator, a huge hurricane force ten and a half, instead of slamming into America, veers off. Because two weeks earlier, a butterfly flapped its wings. So that means that a small input change causes a big result at the other end. And that's the butterfly effect. 
The scientists who worked this out were all sorts of people, computational scientists and mathematicians from all over the world, and they tried hard to make the perfect cup. And you can see they've even got themselves a little beaker and a tamper. But this guy here, this guy here, where did he come from? He's a barista. Obviously, in these pre-COVID times, he came from Melbourne. Well, I know where you came from. You can't hide it. You're a Melbourne person. So these people worked together for four years, and they found the cure. Less is more, remember? So less of a fine grind. In other words, more coarse, so it doesn't clump. Less pressure, so it doesn't clump. And finally, less time, so it doesn't clump. And why are people having this coffee? Well, to get energy out of it. And so you need energy if you're going to do something like heavy flying and you fly thousands of kilometres at altitudes of, say, half the height of Everest. And there's a creature that can do that, but not only does it not have coffee, it doesn't even have wings. Here's a hint. It's not a bird. It's not an insect. What is it? It's a spider. Spiders can fly. Oh, my God. The story goes back to 1832. On the, 1st of October, on the 31st of October, and on a hot and calm day, way out to sea, off the coast of Argentina in the Atlantic, with no land visible, something happened on a ship, the HMS Beagle. Beagle, you think? I've heard that name. This ship. Yes, this was the ship that Charles Darwin circumnavigated the world uh, from 1831 to 1836 and helped change his thinking. So he came up with the theory of evolution. And on this day, he saw thousands of red spiders falling out of the sky. And I quote, all the ropes were coated and ringed with gossamer thread, unquote. And if you happen to be wandering through the countryside and you see this, you've seen what was left after thousands of spiders took off on a flight. And Darwin, being a very keen observer, not just a great brain, but a keen observer with his eyes. He said that the spider would dart forth or push forward four or five threads from its spinners. And here you see a picture of a spider throwing something out of its spinner. And this is at the tail end there, and its head is at the other end. So it's throwing it out. These spinners, or spinnerets, as we call them today, here are some abnormally long ones from an Australian spider. Here's a more regularly sized one. So they, they were darting out these threads. They were more than a yard in length. And look at this next word. They diverged. They spread in an ascending direction from the orifices. And here you can see a spider doing the ascending thing. And they're in two different sizes, 100 or so and 600 or so nanometers. And then the spider suddenly let go of its hold and bingo, it was gone. And here you can see it happening. This is photographed in the infrared. Now notice in the background over here, you've got um, trees photographed in infrared. This is a dome where they scientists did their experiment in a park in Germany. That machine there generates smoke and so they can tell what the wind's doing. And over here, you can see the spider. Here we go. So the spider starts moving around. You see the wind's going all sorts of directions. And it's lifting up its front legs. Mm, legs, yeah, no, yeah, no, maybe. Legs up, legs down, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, thinking about it, uh, the time's ticking past. Hang on, this is good. So it gets up there, and then, look at this. Something came out of the back end, and it came out of the back, it's gone. Let's just play that last bit again, right? So we go forward now, see this? See, if you look carefully, you'll see it makes some threads, and they just take off. And so then it makes another bunch of threads, and it hangs onto them. So it loses the first set of threads, which is the gossamer that you see lying on the grass, right? And so there they are taking off. But what's going on with the diverging? Diverging. Why are they spreading apart? Why do they separate? And Darwin had a theory, which was electrostatic repulsion and blow me down. He was such a genius. He was 100% right. You see, the Earth has a magnetic field, which is maintained down in the core of the Earth by the molten iron. And it also has an electric field maintained by tens of thousands of thunderstorms every day where the ground is negative, the upper atmosphere is positive, and it's roughly about 120 volts per metre. The distance between there is 120 volts per metre. Way up there, it can be a third of a million volts. Here you can see the voltage above an oak tree. Now, this next is a picture of the beagle from the front. And now let's have a look at the beagle from the back. And this is a simulation of what the electric fields would have done in the ocean. And you can see that you've got the tail, the stern of the ship at the left, and the middle front, you've sort of got the bow. So we're looking at the tail end of the ship. 
And where the arrow is pointing to, see those, the big red arrow, so he's pointing to these other arrows, and the notice that the electric field is in a different direction. It's going across, not down. Yes, the electric field is different. So, hence the paper by Morley and Robert called Electric Fields Elicit or Bring Forth Ballooning, that's when they take off and fly, in spiders. Yes, and here you can see the le spiders lifting its legs up. What's, why is it lifting its legs? Well, it turns out that on each of the legs, it's got these little hairs, and we're pointing to it with the little green arrow, and if you go in close, and we're magnifying it up. You can see the white arrow pointing to something. And then in the next blob, you can see there's a single hair. That single hair has the ability to detect electric fields. OMG. Ah, so what they did was that having worked all of this out, they then built a special insulated stand. And then on top of the stand, they put an insulated box and then they shielded it from the Earth's magnetic field and they set up so there was no way, there was no moving air. No moving air. And then they put a spider in there and the spider's just sitting there inside this box, no moving air. And they had a knob and as they turn the knob one way, the electric field goes up and the spider would then extrude the spider web and then hover up. And they could make the spider go up and down by varying the electric field. Oh, my God. And then somebody thought, wow, so we can actually have spiders. We can control what they do. And so Peter Gorham, a physicist at Hawaii, came up with this idea, the case for electrostatic flight. And look at what we've got here. What you are looking at here is a militarized flying electric spider. Because what he said was that you could go and get these guys and you could make a tiny little mechanical spider with the camera weighing less than a tenth of a gram and it could hover on the electric fields and spy on you all the time. And that would be a way, of course, to tell if our world leaders are, in fact, shape-changing reptiles from the planet Zog. But the point is, spiders can fly, and even more, they can think ahead and they can count. Now, so spiders do count. They are incredibly important to us. Very successful. 48,000 species, about 130 of them in each square metre. For 400 million years, they've been making silk. Silk is amazing stuff. It is stronger than steel, weight for weight and volume for volume, and the spiders make it at room temperature with common organic biological chemicals. If we could discover the secret, oh my God, I personally think that it's something like this, that this is how they make it, but that's just me thinking a bit after I might have had a little wine or something. The point is, we don't know how they do it. But they do count because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have any agriculture, according to Dr. Miguel Arnido from Barcelona, who said you wouldn't have any crops because the insects would eat them all and the spiders eat the insects so we can have crops. So not only do spiders do count, they can count. And they prove this with three little experiments. And in the first experiment, they prove the spiders can have a memory. They can, they can make and then read the mind map. They can think, oh, this, 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 yeah, I'll remember that. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll turn left, turn right. Secondly, they can do it efficiently. And thirdly, they can count with numbers. OMG. And they used a spider-eating spider, a little predatory thing called Porsche, and it hunts and kills bigger spiders. It's a jumping spider. It's called Porsche. I don't know why. This is not a CGI photo. The, most spiders are fairly blind. Porsche has really sharp vision. And like all predators, the eyes are at the front. And if two eyes are good, then four is better. And it can, according to another paper by Cross and Jackson, it can decide to whether a detour is necessary or not. They can plan ahead. And another paper that talks about representation of different exact numbers. So these are the people, Cross and Jackson, who did all this work. So you, what you do is you start off with a spider. And you put its, well, OK, here's our spider, right? See our spider? That's Porsche. That's not quite right. Porsche should actually be at the top of a tower. But over here, you can see another tower with dinner up there. And there you can see a wonderful lake. The lake is really important because spiders like this hate water. And the lake is too big to jump across. They'll do anything to avoid water. So you've got the Porsche on one tower over here, and the dinner's over there. And if it comes down the tower, it loses sight of its dinner. So it has to look from here down and go, uh-huh, 
work out a pathway and then remember it and then act on that pathway. This is the dinner. No, it's not. I lied to you. It wasn't a butterfly or a, a little ordinary fly. In fact, it was supposed to be a spider, but they didn't even give it a spider. They gave it a photograph of a spider. Yeah, spiders are a bit pushed for money, all right? We couldn't afford a real spider. Here's a photograph of it. So dinner is a photograph of a spider. The lake is not quite a lake, okay, it's just a little crappy bit of water. But Portia is real on this other tower. Okay, so there's Portia on this little tower. And then look down at the bottom and you can see a pathway. Portia has to remember what's going on, go down the tower, along the pathway, and then it can go straight ahead or chuck a righty. It has to remember to chuck a righty and then chuck another righty and then chuck an uppy, and then it can have dinner. And so Portia's path is not a straight, direct route. How can I remember? I'm having trouble in remembering. How can I do all this stuff? And in fact, it's because it's clever. And the scientists had a whole bunch of different setups. I won't even go into what they are. There were just a lot of them. Experiment number one. Portia could see two pathways from the tower. Looking at the tower, dinner over there, look down, one pathway, the other pathway. One pathway led to dinner. The other pathway did not. Every time... Portia took the path to dinner. Ah, it could make and remember a mind map, something we thought only humans could do. Secondly, it could do it efficiently. So same deal again, two different floating pathways across the lake. Each one led to dinner, but one was shorter and one was longer. You guessed it. Portia took the shorter one. So it could make and remember a map, be efficient. Wow. Third one, let's get into the counting thing, okay? Now I'm going to give you some secret psychological knowledge Right? The first bit of secret psychological knowledge is that if ever you are involved in an experiment where the psychologists are doing something and you're involved, they will lie to you. Keep it a secret, don't tell them. Number two, here's a second bit of secret psychological knowledge. If a creature is doing something and then suddenly does an unexpected pause, that means it was confused. There was a bit of a break between what it expected and what it thought and what it was seeing. And people use this to work out what babies are thinking. So Portia up on the tower, it sees one or more spiders, thinks, okay, one or more spiders, comes down the tower, goes into the blind spot, and while it's in the blind spot, the scientists just swap over the number of spiders. Okay, they swap over the photograph. We can't afford spiders, budget cuts, you know. And then it arrives at the dinner and it pauses. Every other time it doesn't pause. It just goes in there. It pauses and it thinks, wow, I saw one spider, but now I see two or vice versa. Um, now, of course, it's no fool. Okay, I'm confused, but I'm still hungry and at least a dinner. So it can't count very high. It can, I don't know if it can count zero. I mean, we humans invented zero only around the year 900. But it can count to one and two and more than two. So it's got three numbers, one, two, and more than two. But if it could count to four, bop, 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 with four times as many limbs as we humans have, it could be the world's best rock drummer. And it could then become part of the pantheon of royalty in America, which of course are rock and roll bands. But the trouble is, you can be part of that royalty and your family kind of thinks you're a little bit lame. So here you've got Slayer, right? This is uh, Tom Arroyo from Slayer and heavy metal thrash, dark satanic themes, incredible bass guitarist. Uh, his son uh, doesn't think it's worth it at all. He's just sort of got, I'm smiling, dude. And the daughter is going, I am really embarrassed. I'm feeling like a fish out of water. God, get me out of here, Dad. You're so embarrassing, Dad. I'm a fish out of water. And look at this fish. See this fish? See this fish? It's swimming nicely, isn't it? Oh, yeah, good little fish. Yeah, you're swimming nicely. You're doing a great job, fish. Boy, are you swimming well, fish. That is such a good swimming you're doing. What a shame that you are dead. Yes, that fish is dead. Notice this thing over here. That's what's keeping it moving. See the arrow pointing to that half cylinder, what we call a D-cylinder. Yes. Turbulence, see to the left-hand side of that D-cylinder, see some ripples? That is setting off the movements of the fish. That fish has been dead for a couple of days and it's still swimming. Dead fish can swim and so in fact,
can dead whales. Now, in the Martha movies, you've got the phrase, he is sleeping with the fishes, and that means only one thing and it's not good, and here I am being bad. So here we are in the Mafia headquarters, and they're saying, what's this? You're bringing something. And there it is, wrapped in Luca Brasi's bulletproof vest, and the guy says, what the hell is this? What's fish? That's Sicilian the, uh, message. And the Sicilian says, it means Luca Brasi sleeps Sicilian with the fishes. It's Sicilian saying, he is sleeping with the fishes. He is dead. I can work on the accent. I think I need a bit of help. Tate, can you give us a bit of help? Yeah, okay. Okay, I'm cool. But the point is, humans can't swim when they're dead because we haven't evolved for it evolutionarily speaking, whereas fishes have. How do you get this sort of photograph? Well, you set up this sort of thing where you've got the fish in a tank over there and the water flows through in that direction and you've got some lights at the top and over here you've got the D cylinder. And down at the bottom you've got the camera and the light comes through the top, through past the fish, on the mirror, into the camera, and that then gives you a silhouette of the fish. And here's a paper written in 2006 called Passive, Passive Propulsion in Vortex, right? Vortex, important things. And look at the first three words of the abstract. A dead fish. I'm not lying. And vortices is how it moves along. No, they do not have a rocket fish. They do not have a rocket in their tail. But rather, look at the words at the bottom of the screen. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So they don't use a rocket engine, but they're using the same principle of Newton's third law. They push the water backwards and they go forwards. Now, this is interesting here. Observe that you've got a little zero there. That means the centre line of the tank. Left, right. And here we are moving down the tank. And here we're 300 millimetres away. And over here you can see a dark spot. And you're thinking, what is that dark spot? That is literally a rotating whirlpool of water. And because the water's all turbulent, it doesn't go evenly, the light doesn't go evenly through, so it looks darker. And if you look up at the top right, you'll see the flow of the water given by those arrows. So the water's going across this way, and then, as it gets closer, as it gets closer to that rotating whirlpool, it swings up and around, making the whirlpool the vertical cylinder. And so suppose it comes along, and then this whirlpool hits the tail of the fish. Well, it pushes the tail. A lot of energy in pushing the tail. The tail's got a bit of a mechanical engineer, so it re resists it, so less energy is there, but still there's some energy pushing the water back. The water goes that way, so the fish goes this way. And here you can see at intervals of a few tenths of a second, the tail flipping this way and that, swimming in the water. A dead fish can swim and you're thinking, how's it doing it? Isn't that impossible? Well, yes, perpetual motion is impossible and energy is conserved. Okay. I'm going to tell you another secret. <laughs> this is better than the one of the psychologists. Okay, you ready for it? They lied to you. The physicists lied to you. Energy is not conserved in an expanding universe and our universe is expanding. Don't tell anybody, okay? Just pretend that energy is conserved. Nothing to see here. Energy is conserved. So where does the energy come from to push the fish along? From those whirlpools, those vortices in the water. And the fish, not being dumb, living in the water, they use this energy. And how do they find where the energy is? With a thing called the lateral line. And over here, you can see the scales of the fish. One scale there, another one, another one, another one. And over here, there's a line of water just under the surface of the skin. And over there, you can see that little circle. And inside that circle are some hairs. And if you look it up, those hairs can pick up temperature and chemicals and electricity and movement. Oh, my God. So they used this to adjust their body shape to catch the energy in the water. Think about a whale. A whale has to go blunker, blunker and work, go th through the uh, ocean. If they're in a sea that's coming towards them, okay, so the, the waves are coming at them, not behind them, they get one quarter of the energy they need to swim from this turbulence going down the side of their body and above the top and bottom. And if the waves are behind them, they get an extra 10%. And this comes from the old days of whale catching. And, and I quote, dead whales coasting at one knot for extended periods of time. Just a whale in the middle of the ocean. And it's just going by itself. Where does the energy come from? In this case, from the sun pumping out one, when the sun's directly overhead, one kilowatt 
of power per square metre. And you see dolphins jumping off the front of the waves at the beginning of the ship. Well, in this case here, the dolphins are getting the energy off the wave at the front, which comes from the engine in the ship. And so the sports scientists were thinking, we want a piece of the action, man. And so they wrote this paper after doing a lot of research called Numerical and Experimental Investigations of Human Swimming Motions. Think about a swimmer. Okay, here is a swimmer in the water. And you can see a bit of turbulence around their head. That's because their head's partially out of the water. But underneath the body, you don't see nothing. But this is what's really going on. There's all sorts of energies involved, all sorts of energies. And when they kick their leg down, it leaves behind a whirlpool of water. Now, obviously, you can recognise this. I've got to take you through it. This is a complicated photo over here. Here we got. What we got? That's a hand. Trust me, that's a hand. I know it's hard to tell. It's a hand. It looks like a dinosaur thing, but that's a hand, all right? And here's a hand, and here it goes again and again and again and again. So it's a hand of a swimmer going through the water. I wonder who that is. One of the all-time greats, oh he's spoken about Dude, like yeah, that right sort of now. Really Maybe fast. the swimmer oh of the God, century. He goes he in, and it's the there. It is there. It is world record. Oh my God, he's again. not a human. He's and a super again. Thing. Yes, that is definitely a photograph of his, or a simulation of the energies involved in his stroking through the water. See over there with the big red arrows pointing at Ian Thorpe. Now see, if here we see in this one, see the, that's the path of the hand going through the water. See that? Little finger and thumb. And if, as his hand goes through the water, it does an S-shaped path, that creates lift. But if it goes in a straight line, it creates drag. Now, he is a super fish. And the place you're going to read about it is where I get all of my investigative reporting from, from this magazine called Nexus. No, I don't. OK, I think we've gone a little bit over. So now it's time for questions and answers. Is that correct, folks? Yes, we're a little bit over. And we're going to throw to questions. Uh, and we can talk about Nexus magazine. And it's question time for us, standing by. A little tiny drink from my glass of water. And then I shall wash myself with placenta. Oh, my face is so beautiful and smooth with this extract of placenta. Oh, maybe I should uh, also get a mm. bit of that as well, Dr. Carl. Um, look, we have an amazing and the array first question of questions. Is, we have one from Leo, age nine. If the world is made up of atoms, how many atoms would be in the world? If the world is made of atoms, how many atoms are there in the world? Well, there's a really nice coincidence. So look up on Wikipedia the thing called Avogadro number, A-V-O, G-A-D-R-O number. And it's the number of molecules of hydrogen in two grams of hydrogen in 18 grams of water. And, and here's a coincidence, it just blows me out. That's roughly the number of stars in the universe. This is a big number. Six followed by 23 zeros. And it's also equal to the number of grains of sand on Earth and now we get to the weight of the Earth. The weight of the Earth is an Avogadro number of 10 kilogram bricks. Not one kilogram, but 10. So the weight of the Earth in kilograms is 6 followed by 24 zeros. And then you have to work out how many moles that is. And at this stage, I would ask your parents, oh, we're going to give away prizes. We're going to give away prizes, aren't we? So you get a prize of my latest book, which has got augmented reality in it, a hologram. And if you aim your camera after you download the modestly named Dr. Carl app, you can see holograms of me popping up. And by the way, I've got four cordless phones, including a base station at home. If anybody out there wants four quarters, I can't bear to throw them away. Please contact us. I'll give, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a book to take it off my hands. I can't bear to throw it away. So. It's six followed by a bunch of zeros. There we are. I don't know the exact answer, but you can do it from there with moles. Okay, next question. Um, I have a question from Hannah. If people can't see the air, then can fish see water? Um, I think that they can not see something far away, which means that they are seeing the water. So think about you. Now, the, the greatest distance that I have ever seen 
in my life on Earth is about 100 kilometres. And I was down in the Antarctic and we could see the top of Mount Erebus from 100 kilometres away because the air was very dry and there was no water vapour and there was no pollution. But if there's air pollution, I've been in Los Angeles, I couldn't see a kilometre. So in that case, I could kind of be seeing the air, I'm thinking. And so in the same way with a fish, if its vision doesn't go to infinity but it's blocked after 100 metres, then I'm guessing it is seeing the water. Can it see the chemicals in the water only when they come up against this lateral line? And can it see the turbulence? Again, same with the lateral line. And it's kind of a weird thing. So a shark can be going through the water and it can smell. And whereas you and I would sort of go, I think I smell something, they'd say, ah, that was uh, Carl swimming across the bay. He's just about 1.8 metres long and he's really delicious. I'm going to go and eat him. So they can smell that sort of stuff. So they're living in a different world where smells are part of their consciousness and sight is not so much. And you get a free book. Don't forget to activate the hologram. Next question. Uh, next question from Lucas. If the universe is constantly expanding and we are inside the universe, are we all bigger than we were an hour ago? How would we measure if our rulers are all expanding as well? How do we measure shows that you are being a really good sciencey person? How do we measure it? So the way we measure, or did measure, the expansion of the universe was that with a whole bunch of female astronomers and computers at the beginning of the century working for Edwin Hubble. I know, that's the way it was then, so he got all the credit. Um, and it's called the Hubble Constant. And remember that magic number, 42, the universe and everything? Well, turn that from miles into kilometres and you get about 70. So for every 3 million light years, the fabric of the universe speeds up by 70 kilometres a second. Double that, you get 140 kilometres a second. So we can measure this expansion of the universe, but it's a very weak expansion and it's easily overcome by, say, on Earth, the gravity of the Earth, so it ain't expanding, and the gravity of the Sun within our solar system, so that space isn't expanding. And even inside our galaxy, the Milky Way, the overall mass of the Milky Way is having enough gravity to, stop, to well and truly overcome that expansion. But way out in the suburbs, way out in the space between the galaxies, there we can observe the universe expanding. And can we measure it? Well, I would, off the top of my head, have said, probably wrongly no, but then think back. Think back to the 17th of September in the year 2015. And on that day, a gravitational wave, well, two things happened. Firstly, a gravitational wave swept through the Earth. And secondly, Tony Abbott got deposed as Prime Minister of Australia. Now, the obvious question is this. Because a scientific paper was written, who were the authors of that paper? And the first three authors were Abbott, Abbott and Abbott. I kid you not. Is it a coincidence? I don't think so. 24 cans and a slab of beer, 24 hours in a day, it's not a coincidence. There's a higher purpose. But when we measured that gravitational wave coming through the Earth, we measured a distance, a change in distance, over four kilometres, now think about four kilometres, okay, four kilometres, we measured a change in distance of not a millimetre, not an atom, not a nucleus, not a proton, a ten thousandth of a proton. We can measure that, and some people still believe the Earth is flat. We can measure one ten thousandth of the diameter of a proton, so maybe we can measure the tiny amount of expansion that is being in the human body that's being overcome by the gravity of the Earth. We humans are pretty good. So the answer is I don't know. Next. Thanks, Carl. Uh, I have a question from Rachel. Uh, the question is, can you add milk to this coffee, as in your perfect coffee? How would you add the milk? Devil. Talking devil. Milk. <laughs> look, OK, look, Rachel, no, look, you're right. OK, this is how it works, right? Firstly, when they say you should not have milk, they are telling you lies. Milk is good for you. And it's part of it for most people. For, for two-thirds two of the world, 
did not get the mutation out of Hungary 7,000 years ago, and they cannot have a milkshake. One third of the world, for people who came from that genetic stock in Hungary 7,000 years ago, that includes me, I can have a milkshake. Everybody can have a little bit of milk in a cup of tea, but milk is an essential source of uh, calcium. Now, let me tell you how it works. You build up calcium in your bones, and dairy products are a good source for most people. You build up calcium in your bones, and you reach the maximum number of grams of calcium in your bones that you will ever have in your whole life, in your early 20s, if you are a female, and your late 20s if you're a male, and then after it, that's it. You cannot go higher. All you can do is keep the same or go lower. So one part of me says, no, coffee is pure and should never be sullied by milk. But the other part of me says, hey, come on, man, I live in the real world. So do you add the milk first or last? Well, that all depends if you want the milk, if you want the coffee to stay hot. So you're about to pour the milk into the coffee and then suddenly there's a ring at the door and there's a human there and you want the coffee to stay as hot as possible. Should you add the coffee now or later? And the answer is, if you want the coffee to stay as hot as possible, add the milk early rather than when you come back from answering the door because that brings down the temperature and the amount of heat lost depends on uh, the temperature difference between the coffee and the ground. That's Newton's law of cooling. But should you add, put the coffee there, put the milk in and add the coffee later, that's beyond my knowledge. I, I, you have to ask a dietitian uh, like Professor Claire Collins or the, the University of Sydney has a wonderful dietetics department. Ask a dietitian, they will tell you the truth on that outside my range of knowledge, I don't know. Next. Thanks, Carl. Chelsea asks, do you think it's worth using billions of dollars for space exploration? Should we be using it for other things that can help people? Ah, the most expensive, the absolute most expensive the space travel ever got was 2% of only the American budget back in the 60s. And then it went from 2% to 0.2% to 0.02%. You want to see a big budget? Go for the military budget. That's where the big bucks are. Space travel has given us so much. It has given us the ability to predict the weather and then avoid storms, improve the fuel economy of planes. When they used to go flying, they will again, and help farmers enormously. The technology from space flows through to the average person. We benefit from that technology. GPS is, is just a tiny part of it. The amount of money spent on space exploration is microscopic and we need to become a space going race just for survival. In 2015, a rock 600 metres in diameter just missed the Earth and if it had hit the Earth, depending on where it landed, middle of the ocean, Pacific Ocean, or the middle of Australia, or Antarctica, or a super volcano, depending on where it would have landed, it would have killed between 10 and 70% of the world's population within a week. If we'd had three years warning, we could have nudged it out of the way or done something. We had only three weeks. We have to become a space going race and it's really cheap and it provides lots of high end employment and it flows through to society. Space exploration is an investment in the greater society. Military spending, I've got my doubts. Next. Thanks, Carl. Uh, I have a question from Pippa. How are hiccups caused? How are what? Hiccups. Hiccups. Hiccups are an accident. I hope there's some kids listening because I'm going to gross you out now. For the first nine months of your life, you spent your time floating around inside your mother's tummy, here it comes, drinking your own wee. Ugh. So the amniotic fluid is a bunch of liquids including your own wee. And so for the first nine months, your lungs are taking the amniotic fluid in and out and in and out. Here's, the, here's a summary. Hiccups have no purpose. They're left over. They're, so you're, you're breathing this liquid in and out. And yet, 
you're going to get born. You know, well, soon one day you're going to get born and you're going to go out into the air and air is different in weight from water. One cubic metre of water, a thousand kilograms. One cubic metre of air, one and a quarter kilograms. A thousand or one and a quarter. It's really easy to move air in and out. So when you're inside the uterus, the training you're getting for breathing is wrong. It's not going to train your muscles on how to breathe. So in the later parts of pregnancy, for about three quarters of an hour every day, you hiccup. And the hiccuping is training your muscles in a way so that when you're born, you squirt all the liquid out of your lungs and you start breathing and blow me down, you've got enough muscle strength to do it and you have to work fairly hard for the first hour. And by the end of the first week, you're on top of it. So hiccuping is there as an essential thing to train your lungs on how to breathe air before you get born and after that they're totally useless and the world record for hiccuping I think was 63 years and it was cured by and I quote fierce praying I don't know how you do fierce praying but that's what it said in the Guinness Book of Records thanks Carl uh, I have a question from Jack what is the purpose of color in evolution and will it evolve further um, well firstly now, I'm not an evolutionary biologist. What's the purpose of colour? I'm not an evolutionary biologist, but I love reading their stuff. And it seems that evolution doesn't really have a purpose. It just is. And things happen by accident. It's just close enough. If I can see only one colour, then I might not be able to see the red food, the red berries against the green bushes. But if I've got three different types of sensors in the retina, some that are sensitive to red, some to blue, some to green, then I can see the red berry. So it's a survival characteristic. And there is a fish, not a fish, it's a, called the praying mantis. Now it's a, a, a mantis shrimp, that's it. It's got 16 colour sensors in its retina. And it can look at a featureless bit of ocean floor and think, look at all that food down there, I'll go right there. By the way, these guys have got a little hammer and they bang it against the food and kill it. They can move the hammer so fast, they can break glass in the aquarium. And they can move the hammer so fast that they can give you a nasty dent, in a flesh wound in your thumb, and they can move the hammer so fast that it creates a vacuum behind it. And this vacuum then collapses. You get a bubble and it collapses and you generate temperatures hotter than the surface of the sun. So all the humans on Earth have three colour sensors in our retina or, or, or types of retinal cells called cones, C for cone, C for colour, that pick up colour. And so there's the blue at 440 nanometres, the green at 525 nanometres and the red sensitive cones at 575 nanometres. And everybody's got three except for about a couple of percent of males have only got two of them. They've got the blue and then they might have a red or they've got the blue and the green. They're missing one of them, the reds and the green. And, then, and there's one woman in England called Elizabeth and she has got four. She's got two reds, two red sensitive. And she can see shades of red that the rest of us can't. We say, it's red. And she says, oh no, it's totally different. Are we evolving? Yes, we're evolving all the time. And here's a weird thing. We humans are the first creature to be able to control our own evolution. So how, how much more time do we have? I three three more you, minutes? Yes, okay. I think we can do a three couple more. Questions. more. Okay, here we go. Three more questions. Uh, a question from Lisa. How is it that our minds can create an image of an object we are thinking of? If, for example, if I think of a unicorn, why can I see a unicorn in my mind? If you think of a unicorn, suddenly how come you can see it? Well, firstly, because unicorns are real, obviously, and the pink ones are a bit rare, but yeah, I've seen a couple of those. Um, secondly, things can work backwards. I'll give you an example. Sound comes in through the air. There's pressure waves, right? And the pressure waves land on your eardrum 
and the eardrum goes backwards and forwards, and then some bones jiggle around, and they push up against a membrane, and on the other side of the membrane is a liquid, and the liquid has pressure waves going through it, and then sticking up the liquid are some hair cells, and they bend, and when they bend, they give off electricity, and suddenly you're thinking, hi, somebody said, hello, Lisa. And it can also work backwards. Two or three percent of people have the system going backwards, so their ears make noise. And this is how they test hearing in babies. They get a loud noise and blast it at the baby's ear and they listen with a tiny micro microphone. And if the ear makes some noise back, that shows that the baby could hear it. In the same way, light comes in here and then gets processed um, in the retina and then goes to the middle of the head then to the back of the head. And at the back of the head, there are areas called the Brodmann areas, 19, 20 and 21, also called the visual cortex. And they turn electricity into this image. And then suddenly, three tenths of a second after reality, you actually see this full 3D colour image. So all you have to do is put some electricity into the visual processing area and suddenly you're seeing this image. And you don't have to get the electricity from your eyeball, you can get it from somewhere in your memory banks, I think. The people who would know about this are the visual electrophysiologists and I used to be one of those, but I'm not anymore. So I've forgotten it all. Sorry. Next Fantastic, question. Carl. We have one more, I think. Uh, a question from Fiona. Are we going to have bigger thumbs due to using smartphones? Are we going to have bigger thumbs using smartphones? Yes and no. With regard to bacteria that evolve against antibiotics, well, a generation in a bacterium is 20 minutes. So you expose them to antibiotics, say for a week in a human, that's three generations in an hour, three by 24 a day, so that's 75. 75 by six is about 400 generations. And after a week, you're beginning to see some resistance evolving. So if we humans, were to use it for, say, 500 generations, the uh, smartphones, well, 500 generations, add two noughts, divide by four, that's 12,500 years. I strongly suspect we won't be using smartphones in 12,500 years, so we probably won't have that time to evolve for it. On the other hand, I was on the bus, and I saw this kid sitting on his parents' lap. And this little three-year-old kid saw something out the window, and it looked at the, through the window, and reached his hand out, and to make the image bigger, it went like that. It, it scraped its hands on the inside of the glass to make the world bigger, and the kid was disappointed when it didn't happen. So maybe we, so I, I don't think we'll have enough time. We'll go into a bigger and better technology before then. Does anybody want the uh, phones? Like the, they're, they're really not. I, I put a new battery in them and everything. They work. There's one base station and three remotes. Please take them. Thank you okay, so where much, are we at now, Dr. Catfish? Yes, uh, thank you so much for that. Um, we did have a couple of people saying they were interested in the phones, but if you could email us um, at science.alliance at sydney.edu.au, maybe we could hook you up. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Carl, and uh, we have come to the end of our program. Thank you all, you audience, for your fantastic questions. A recording of this talk will be uploaded to Sydney edu.au slash science in the next few days uh, for you to share around and watch again as uh, however you wish. Uh, we've just kicked off National Science Week, so please do join us for many, many more science events from the University of Sydney. Um, you can visit that same website for a list of all our events. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Carl and KJ, once more. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and I wish you the most enjoyable uh, rest of your National Science Week. Goodbye for now.